Well, uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Welcome to Pevi International Seminar Series. Uh, I'm Neerman Yilmaz, and together with Marcus Birken, uh, we are hosting the, this International Seminar Series. And today, we have the pleasure of having Professor Dr. Ann Pringle from the University of Wisconsin Medicine to, uh, as our host. And has, uh, Anne has been on the sabbatical at Pepe for almost a year, and we are absolutely delighted to have her uh, leading today's seminar. Now, without over, further ado, I'm handing over to Anne, who will introduce our speaker, and let's get ready for an engaging and a, enlightening season. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. It's a delight. Agnese and I have known each other for a very long time, um, and uh, she was brave enough a long time ago to listen to various rantings about spore dispersal. Um, and we represent some of the very few people in the world who have cared about it. And I <laughs> hope today that we can convince a lot more people to care about it. So Agnese is an Italian physicist, straight up physicist, um, who graduated from the University of uh, Genoa um, in, 20, in 2004. And she got her PhD from the University of Nice in France she moved to Harvard University and the Institut Pasteur for her postdocs, and then she became a faculty member, um, first as a researcher, then as a research director at the CNRS um, Institut de Physique de Nice in 2013, where I had the pleasure and my family had the pleasure of spending a lot of time, various Januaries year after year. It was very nice to go from the East Coast to Nice in January. Um, and then she moved back to the University of Genoa in 2021. Um, she studies the fundamental properties of turbulence. I'm going to stop reading from the can. Basically, this is what Agnese does. She studies particles. Um, she studies how particles move around. She doesn't particularly care what kind of particles she's studying. They're particles. They all follow the same rules of physics. So today you're going to hear about a certain kind of particle that people in this audience care about a lot, which are um, spores. And I'm going to leave it at that because I know she has a lot to say. So Agnese, thank you so much for taking time um, out of your day. I know it's uh, not so easy um, to give us a talk and we're all pretty excited to hear what you have to say. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne, for the introduction, uh, Neriman and the Fabi Institute. I'd love to be there with you. I cannot. And so I'm, I'm here, but I hope I'll be able to engage you at least with my hands. Um, so um, yeah, I have too much to say, I'm sure of that. So please uh, interrupt me and slow me down. Uh, the, the tale that I want to uh, tell you about today is a tale of different scales. So we'll start with the movie on your left. Those are spores that get out from fungi. And then we'll move towards the right. In the middle movie, you see a lot of spores at, when they are just out of the fungus. And then on the further right, you'll see how they get transported by the atmosphere. So across continental scales, that map is a map of like a, portion, a large portion of the US. Right, and, and so in this tale, there, there are, so I, I started to care about spores as um, say my first introduction to biology. I was uh, working on turbulence and I was thinking about clouds and particles in clouds, which as Anne was saying, are, are just particles, right? So some of the properties of uh, particles in clouds are similar to the properties of spores that get transported in, in from fungi through canopies across the atmosphere and then on the next host or on the next uh, uh, land to colonize, right? Um, and so I'll, I'll try to walk you over these different scales because uh, some of these are more um, familiar probably to a lot of you and some of them are, are less familiar, but I just think they're fascinating and putting them back together is, uh, um, is a big question. So I'm gonna talk about spore dispersal uh, from takeoff to landing, meaning from within the fungus to outside. And so something that probably you don't need too much of an, intro of an introduction about, but I'll just go very quickly, is why would we be interested in fungi? And I guess a lot of you um, are familiar with pictures like the one I'm, I'm showing you here, 
where um, there are, the fungi make it to headlines because they cause diseases and particularly emerging di diseases. And this is uh, especially scaring in the world that's changing and we don't know what is the next disease that will emerge and how we'll tackle it. Of course, this is number one, but it's just not the end of the story. A lot of the fungi that um, we probably know less about are essential to ecosystems. And here, this is one of my favorite pictures because uh, uh, probably a lot of you know about this, but what you see on the left is uh, the roots uh, of a plant um, as they would be um, on their own. Um, this is a cross section and you see the seedling that's coming out. And this is a cross section, those are the roots. But in fact, roots in nature are most commonly found in symbiosis with much larger networks. And these are fungi, that's the picture on the right. Um, and so this uh, symbiosis is a fascinating phenomenon that basically enables the life of, of a lot of plants. And so fungi are not only threats, they are also essentials for ecosystems. And one third point that I would like to mention is conservation, because uh, uh, fungi are, um, are not well described. It's a mega diverse kingdom of uh, many species and the number, even the estimate ranges from one to eight millions. Um, so we don't know a lot about them. And so you, we also don't know how to make lists of uh, what fungi should be preserved and how we should do it and how should we prioritize them. So it, overall, I just wanted to give you a, a gist for uh, what's the impact of, uh, of uh, fungi for our life on earth. And it, it's clearly huge. Now I'm gonna tell you about spores. So why are spores important? Again, something that you probably are very familiar with is uh, what spores are in the life, uh, life cycle of a fungus as they are at the same time uh, the progeny uh, they come in this uh, in this figure. You see, they arise both in uh, um, the. Can you see my arrow? If I point it like this, <laughs> okay, great. So here's the um, uh, the asexual part of the life cycle, the vegetative part where the the body of the fungus grows. It's happy and healthy. There's a lot of food. It's just keeps growing and typically asexual spores are produced in this life cycle. This is just a generic picture of a heterotelic uh, fungal life cycle. And then at some point, something happens. Um, typically the conditions vary, uh, something is not quite right and the fungus decides to um, undergo sexual reproduction. And uh, through this, this second leg of the life cycle, uh, typically sexual spores arise and they arise because uh, um, there, this depends a lot on the on the fungus that we're going to look at but um, in the fungus that's uh, depicted here there's a perithecium this would be a fruit body that contains the cells that contain the spores so we're going to talk a lot about this and then the spores mature and they are ready and once this happens once the spores are ready ejection happens. So some, somehow the fungus that has this body and has this uh, fruit bodies that typically emerge from the ground needs to liberate the spores in the air, typically. We're gonna talk about liberation in air. It's not the only way uh, spores can get across uh, different environments, but uh, it's very widespread. Okay, and so what I just told you about this liberation process occurs at very small scales. But once the spores are out, then they get transported by the air as any other particle would. And so they, they'll cross typically uh, the, the mushroom that surrounds them. They want to do that to get into a new environment. And then a, a lot of them seems that uh, can travel across large distances, where large distances is not um, very well defined, different people have different uh, um, definitions, but there are at least some examples, and here is one, where it appears that viable spores were transported across oceans on dust particles, and then they were able to infect corals, so they were definitely alive. Okay, and this is a long journey that starts from liberation at the micro scale, 
and then gets to planetary scales. Okay, so basically spores are of the same, the progeny and the locomotion mechanism for fungi. So this is what um, makes them so uh, fascinating and important for their survival. Okay, so here's the story. It's, uh, it doesn't look very ambitious seeing it like this. Uh, it's a night, there are three items, <laughs> but it's going to be a lot of um, material. So I'm, I'm going to try and be as clear as possible, but please stop me anywhere uh, if I'm not clear. So let's start from the micron scale. So liberation. Here is a movie that is very slow, but basically what you see is one of those fruit bodies that I showed you in the picture uh, before. Um, it's transparent, so you can see the cells that contain the spores that elongate and get out. And once one of the, of the cells gets to the tip of the fruit body right here, then spores get liberated. Okay, this is called the perithesium. It has this shape. It's a kind of like a flask shape. Uh, it's particularly interesting because it's transparent, but the same cell, these, the cells that contain the spores, these are called acai. The singular is ascus, the plural is acai. They contain typically eight spores. And they're very special cells that elongate a lot. As you can see, you see the, the black discs. Those are the spores. The cells remain attached to the base of this fruit body. So they have to elongate a lot. And once they have, are long enough, then they shoot the spores. The mechanism for shooting them varies in different uh, families. In the ascomycetes, it's typically this one that I'm showing you here. Uh, basically, you have this here. Uh, I'm depicting, um, uh, this is a one frame of a high speed movie that is one of the first movies we, I took at Harvard when uh, I met uh, Anne. Um, it's a high-speed movie. Uh, our idea was to just try and film this shooting happening. Um, these two long cylinders that you see, these are two examples of these cells. They're called assay, and the eight discs are the eight mature spores. When the spores are mature, what happens is that for one reason or another, the osmotic uh, pressure inside uh, the cell increases. It's either glycolysis or um, influx of, uh, of ions. It depends on what the species is. Anyways, the, the uh, result of this increase in osmotic pressure is swelling. And as the cells swell, basically they, they undergo a controlled explosion where uh, the spores get out from the tip. Okay. So how does this work? Well, since uh, um, I'm a physicist, I'm gonna try and talk about energy and try to think about what is the speed that I can achieve in this uh, process. And well, in the under the uh, simple possible, uh, simplest possible assumptions, there is potential energy before shooting, meaning that the cell is ready to shoot. It it has undergone. It has elongated. It's under pressure, turbo pressure, and right after explosion, all of that energy gets converted into accelerating the spores. So there's no more potential energy, all of that energy gets converted into kinetic energy. Okay, under this very simple assumption, we have the maximum velocity of the spore, which is actually quite high because uh, the pressure that's reached inside these uh, this cells is very high. Okay, this is however wrong. And the reason why it's wrong is because there is dissipation, which means that a portion of the available energy gets wasted. And why it gets wasted? It typically gets wasted at the tip of the cells. And now I'm gonna tell you about one specific structure that many species share. It's called a pore or apical ring. The, the species that have this, um, uh, this structure are called poly poricidal and they're scattered across all of the ascomycetes. Okay, this ring, you can see it here in white. Here is a cross section, I, I, I hope it's clear. It's a ring, so it's normally closed, but as the spore gets out of the cell, it needs to open up the ring a little bit, right? To get out, to squeeze out, right? And, and so as it 
it squeezes out, pushing this ring open, dissipation happens. And it happens for two different reasons. It happens because if the geometry of the ring and of the spores are such that there is a very tiny little gap between the spore and the ring, this is represented here in green, you see this is a very small gap, mean, meaning that the spore is squeezing out the ring a lot. It's pushing on the ring a lot. If this happens, then uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, viscosity and, and fluids, this creates what's called a shear, um, shear, a large shear, which means that the velocity at, uh, near the spore, attached at the spore, is equal to the velocity of the spore and the velocity at the ring is still, it's zero. So it, there is a large gradient of velocities in this very thin gap. These are large gradients and it creates a lot of dissipation because of viscosity. So this isn't a good idea. So let's make the ring very large, right? Maybe we'll minimize this kind of uh, energy dissipation. And that is true, but on the other hand, we cannot make it too large because as we make it too large, this gap, this fluid layer becomes so large that a lot of, of the epiplasm will come out with the spore. And because the epiplasm is under pressure, it's what's forcing the spore out. So losing fluid means losing pressure head, losing the, the energy that pushes it outwards. So that's not good either, right? Okay, and so long story short, there is an optimal gap thickness, right? And, and so um, the pink here is the fluid, the white is the cross section of this ring that's at, at the tip of the of this cell. How, to go, how could on earth a fungus make sure that this gap thickness is right, that it's not too large, it's not too small, right? It's not something that you could have a gene for. So how could you have, how could you ensure that you don't waste energy, that you put the maximum amount of energy to actually accelerate the spore? Uh, for this, I'm not gonna get into the details, but you can calculate what's the optimal age and what is the age that results from something that the fungus can potentially control, which is morphology, right? So give me morphology, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll make calculations, I'll couple this fluid and elastic problem, I'll tell you what H comes out. And then let's equal that to the optimal H, what comes out is a constraint that will tell me after a few months, what is the optimal morphology that ensures to use the maximum amount of energy. Okay, and here again, um, this is, um, it, it, you don't need to look into the details of what this, of, of this constraint, uh, of the mathematics of this constraint. It doesn't matter what the details are, but there is a constraint. If I want to minimize energy dissipation, I need to have all of the dimensions of the spore and the ring come together in a specific way. Okay, and if, if uh, we look at this a weird, complicated mathematical formula that we don't want to understand right now, we'll see that it is a line on a suitable graph, meaning that on the left, we have W that is the spore width. On the right, we have, we are multiplying two things. One is a combination of the material parameters and one is a combination of all of the different dimensions that define the ring. The morphology of the ring. And yes, okay. so this is a yes. Are you are you okay to take questions in the middle? Absolutely. Yeah. So I should explain to everyone that there is a completely different culture in physics versus biology. In biology, we sit mm -hmm. all quiet like church mice until the end of the talk, and then we ask questions. In physics, if you have not sit within the first ten minutes, you're being quite rude. Um, so we're going to follow this <laughs> protocol because I think that's what I'm here for. I'd love that. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll be in the dark. <laughs> yeah, I know. Zoom talks yeah, are yeah. so hard that way. So to finish up this first part of the story, we here we have this prediction that sort of comes out of uh, 
abstract uh, theoretical uh, and conceptual questions. How should you design one such cells in order to minimize energy dissipation? Okay, and, and here's the prediction. And now what we can do is we were hoping to actually have uh, high speed movies and see all of these parameters as they evolve in time, etc. This is absolutely impossible. We went to the top cameras that we we had uh, available at the time, and it was just impossible because it's too fast. And so instead, we asked our grad student, York at the time, to go into the literature and look for high resolution TEM sections of spores and pores at the same time. So the, this apical ring structure and spores at the same time. And he found a lot of them. Here you see basically how they are scattered across the phylogeny. They come mainly in these two big groups, the sordariomycetes and the leotiomycetes, but also in these other two, um, two groups. And then he took all of these pictures, like the ones that you see here, and then he measured. He has the error bar, he has the measures, and so we can see if the prediction works. And what we found out is that basically here you have the theory again in a suitable graph where we write the, we plot the correct combinations of quantities. This is a line. The theory is a line. And so all of the data that Jörg was able to collect fall reasonably close to the line where then we can debate whether plus or minus 2% of the optimum is actually optimum to what extent this needs to be optimized. Etc. I don't have time to dig into these questions, but this just opened up the hypothesis that these pores are actually structured in order to maximize the energy that's, that accelerates the spores, maximize spore velocity, right? And this, the question that comes from Sudhir Navate is, my question is, can we predict the natural dispersal distance of a particular pathogen? in primary or secondary disease cycle. Um, let me get to the third part of the talk to answer the question because we are too far right now to actually give you a short answer. Uh, the answer is that you can try and be very specific about a specific pathogen that you care about and we can do things as, as, uh, as precisely as possible, but there are data that are needed. And I'm, I'm gonna get there. And if you are able to provide me with those data, then I can design a simulation that exactly, or exactly as precisely as possible, gives you an understanding of where it goes. Is the phylogenetic constraint also about the EP plastic fluid composition and that's elasticity? That's a great question. So it turns out that the epiplasm is, a, is not a Newtonian fluid, and it looks like there are um there are there would be ways to minimize uh the uh, viscosity and so to minimize one portion of the energy dissipation we haven't looked at this uh specifically i don't know how we would go about it because the measures of viscosity tend tend to be macroscopic you have to have a fluid viscometer so you would have to have a lot of uh, milliliters many milliliters of uh of uh, epiplasmic fluid. So I don't know if you can actually measure it, but there's a lot of work on how polymers affect the properties of fluids. So that's a definitely, would be definitely interesting. Nico Dam says, don't you need friction for dissipation too? As long as the deformation of the ring is elastic, there is no net energy loss. I'm not sure I understand the question, Nico. Can you? explain don't you need friction for dissipation too both kinds of uh, energy dissipation occurs for different reasons one is because of viscosity so friction friction coming from the fact that there is a fluid layer and the fluid layer is so thin that if you shear it it opposes viscous friction. There could be dry friction, but I, I doubt there would ever be any dry friction because there is a plasmic fluid. That's what you meant. Okay, so 
so this theory seems to work quite well. So then the next thing we did, we did a, a, quite a lot of uh, different things on this data set. And then we looked for species across uh, the phylogeny that still have the pore, but don't forcibly shoot because they evolved other ways to release their spores, either passively or there are some daily quescent fungi. We didn't find many. We found, I think, 11 or 12 species. And this is how the same plot looks like when you put the data for these um, non-functional apical rings. And here you see in gray, the same gray that you see in the main plot, it's now squeezed onto the line, which is down here. And the blue dots that appeared are all much further away from optimality, which suggests that this is not just a phylogenetic constraint that comes from the fact that your ancestor was close to optimality. And so all of the um, descendants uh, are still optimal. It suggests that this is a constraint that comes from actually uh, being able to shoot spores far. Okay, this closes a little bit the first, uh, uh, the, the micro scale of uh, part of the talk. Uh, and the bottom line of this first part of the talk is that we found evidence that the microscopic fungal cannons that shoot spores out, at least the, those that have this apical ring, are look optimal. And it looks like uh, selective pressure put, kept this species close to optimality. And that it's not that with genetic drift, you would drift away from optimality as well in the absence of, uh, of uh, function. Okay. What happens next? Well, what happens next is the spores is uh, the spore is now out, okay? And what happens is that it will travel a certain distance, right? And this distance initially will be driven by the speed at which it has been shot. This is the whole point of the previous part of the talk, right? We tried to maximize speed, minimize dissipation so that for our budget of energy, we would get the maximum speed of ejection. And then what happens now is that, uh, let, let me finish this uh, slide. So, um, so I finish the, this, this part and then I'll take the question. Uh, what happens next is that uh, since spores are ejected at a very large velocity, but they are very small, inertia is basically entirely useless in the sense that here you see in yellow, the basic equation of motion for a solid particle similar to a spore, it will decelerate due to gravity and due to friction. And actually gravity is entirely negligible. It's all about friction, right? And it's friction because this tau, it's the response time scale of a particle in a fluid. It depends on the size. Large things respond with a very slow decay, with a very slow time scale. And so their speed keeps remaining, they decelerate very slowly. So they remain at high speed for a long time. Small particles, and here you have the formula, tau is this response time scale, is proportional to the square of the radius. So this time scale for a 10 micron particles say that the spore is 10 micron in size and it, its volume is similar to the volume of a sphere of this size. Then this time scale is two milliseconds. So that means that even if I'm ejected at a, a speed of meters per second, which is a very high speed, and that's the typical speed of fungal spores just ejected uh, in the air, I will decelerate in a matter of millimeters, right? So the math doesn't add up. I do all of this optimization at the micron scale, and then I get out and I only travel a few millimeters. That's not even enough to get out of basically the boundary layer that surrounds the mushroom, the fruit body that shoots the spore out. This is a representation here of what the boundary layer is. The boundary layer is a layer of air that surrounds any a uh, solid body, and that's an, a, a layer of air that's basically still. 
So if you're shot within this boundary layer, you just slowly fall back onto the parent focus and you won't even make it into dispersive air currents. So that seems like a, a very bad option. And we, I don't know how far you would like to go, but I know that you want to go outside of the parent focus because that's the whole point of producing sexual spores to explore new environments. Okay, now I can take the question. Hi, Anise. When they compare the dispersal is under in vitro conditions, same environment, or they are from different locations. I don't know what you are referring to, though, Marcos. Um, when they compare dispersal, I don't know what you are referring to. This is our work. The previous work is a theoretical work that tells us what's the geometry that optimizes the speed of ejection. And now we got to the point where even if you maximize the speed of ejection, you only end up a few millimeters from the fruit body. And so something that happens is depicted here, and maybe I can ask you a question right now. And uh, um, if somebody has the answer, maybe they can write it in the chat. Um, this is what happens in a lot of mushrooms. These are called the discomycetes. They are uh, mushrooms where um, they're uh, Ascomycetes and their fruit body is made in the in the form of a cup. It's open to the air. Okay. And what happens is what you see here, and now this is a petri dish, it's 10 centimeters in size, maybe eight centimeters. So either we did all of the math wrong or something is happening here, right? Because I just told you as the spores come out, they only travel a few millimeters, right? But here this jet of spores is tens of centimeters. So that's entirely wrong. There's a factor of 10, 20, that's entirely wrong. It's off in my estimate, right? So maybe somebody knows what's happening, but this is actually my first project when I started to think about, about fungi. And thinking about it, what we came up with was, well, this is not a single spore. These are many spores, and so maybe, what happens is the same that happens in the picture right here. I don't know if you have seen this awesome animation movie. It's called La Triplette de Belleville. It's about this guy who runs races. And when you, runs, when you run a race, typically in, in biking, that's very famous. If you are, if you bike close together with a lot other um, people, then you'll minimize the drag. And the reason why you minimize the drag is because there's somebody ahead of you. And so it's creating a favorable current. And then you bite in the wake of that favorable current. And if you do the calculations for the Tour de France, this effect can account for about a 30% increase or you save 30% of energy by doing this. Something like this, this is an, esp an estimate I read. Now, the question is, if spores do the same thing, do they gain a factor of 10? Factor of 10 means a uh, thousand percent, right? So much better than for the Tour de France. Are spores so much better than bikers at doing drafting in racing? And this is the, this is the question I'm gonna answer in a second. So, Anne Pringle says that this is a sclerotinia species. Yes, the previous one, she's talking about this one. Um, is the differential density of the spore suspension and the air also included in your model? You see this in a second, absolutely. Okay, so again, the math, just for those of you who are interested into this, but basically just the gist of it, on the left, you see the equations that tell me the trajectory of a spore, so the position of the spore, xi for each spore, and its velocity, u, big u. And on the right, you see the equation that tells me how the air moves across space and time. So small u is a field that changes everywhere because the, the air motion will, um, will be different in space and time. Okay, these are famous equations that I did not invent at all, but what I included was this interaction between air and spores. Here in the circle on the right, you see that 
spores are decelerated because they encounter the resistance of air, right? This is exactly the thing that we calculated in the first slide, okay? Tau is the, tau is the uh, Stokes time scale, the time scale of response of uh, a spore to surrounding air. On the right here, in, circled in red, you see the same effect, but seen from the air. So the air decelerates the spore. As this happens, the spore accelerates the air, right? So each spore is basically a point force in the same direction because they're all ejected at the same, in the same direction. Okay, so once you have this, you can even start with no external wind at all and see what is the effect of the spores on the air. And this is what comes out basically uh, in red here, down here. Uh, that's the initial position for all the spores, okay? And there is no forcing here, except that spores are ejected at an initial speed and they drag air with them as the air decelerates them. And this is what comes out. Uh, it's uh, uh, a direct numerical simulation. So it simulates these equations with this interaction and no external forcing, right? And so here you see that basically the simulation tells us, yes, the spores are much better than us at doing drafting in racing. If they all go in the same direction, direction in individual spores would go under these conditions at eight millimeters distance, but altogether they go a factor of 10 further than they would go alone. Okay. And so to answer the question, I'll just give you a gist about what math one could do on this simulation, because this is a numerical simulation. It spits the solution. We want to understand the solution. So to say, why 80 millimeters? Why? What sets that the range of the cloud of spores? And what sets this is, uh, quite surprisingly, gravity. You should be surprised because I told you that spores are small. So they don't feel gravity. Everything is dictated by friction. And this is true here in the first layer. As soon as they get out in the air, in a matter of few milliseconds, they will just decelerate to basically zero. Not exactly to zero though, because all of the single projectiles create a flow. And this flow accelerates from the, disc, from the fruit body to the first few millimeters and it reaches the speed big U, right? At this location here, after the first range of a few millimeters, basically the air and the spores move at the same speed. And this speed is generated by the collective action of these many projectiles. Okay. And then what happens next? Next happens gravity meaning that, and this answers the question, this plume is a heavy plume. It's not pure air, it's air plus spores. So the material that this plume is made of is heavier than the surrounding air. And this sets the height. There are details here that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna swap under, under the rug, but apart from details and small corrections, gravity is what stops the range of the jet. Okay, and this is the, so we were very excited because uh, we, we drove up, I remember Anne, we drove up to uh, Cornell. It was like a long uh, drive. We picked up a lot of this um, sclerotinia fungi that our collaborators uh, at Cornell um, in, um, um, they are able to grow this, um, this pathogens in Petri dishes, so they shared I don't know how many, but tens of petri dishes with ripe fruit bodies. We brought them back to the lab and then we did what's called PIV, particle image velocimetry. It's something that you do all the time in fluid dynamics. We did it directly with the spores. We didn't even need any fluorescent particle or any particular device. We just opened the lid, shined the laser and imaged the spores as they would come out. And it turns out that the theory and the experiment actually work quite well together. Okay, and then here I should take questions. 
I probably don't know the basics as such, but is it possible that spores don't travel very far by design as compared to autotrophic plant particles like pollen, given fungi is usually found close to each other? Um, so the question of how far fungi spores need to travel is a very hard question that I'll not even attempt at answering because I don't think we have a sense of that. One thing that I think is true is that if the fungus goes through the trouble of producing sexual spores, this is generally believed um, as a response to unfavorable environment or to try and, and explore another environment. But if they don't make it outside of the boundary layer, they will explore no other environment. They'll just fall back basically on the parent fungus. So I do believe that sexual spores are often, I mean, one of their functions is to explore another environment. So I do believe that the physics imposes them to actually evolve um, adaptations to actually get around, at least to cross the boundary layer. This is my, my what I, I, I want to put forward. I don't know how far they should go. I don't, I'm not saying they should go as far as possible, but at least cross the boundary layer. How many spores are required to be shut together to see an efficient draft? So this, we have uh, in the paper, there are more quantitative uh, arguments about this. What matters is the combination of how many there are in uh, like their density on 2D density on the, on the disc and how fast they're shot. These are the two numbers that actually make the largest contribution. Then small apathy, if the, if the apothecia are large enough, if the cup is large enough, this is the only thing that matters. So it's not the total amount of spores that matters, but their density. If the, the number of spores is such that um, the apothecium is very small, to maintain the same density, you have to go smaller. Then if, if uh, the apothecium is very small, you have further contributions. So it, there's a, you have to add your bets if you don't have many spores, which means you cannot make a dense, large apothecium, you have to add your bets. There are more quantitative uh, algorithm, um, arguments in the paper. Okay, this said, uh, this sort of concludes this uh, second part of the talk, which is the mesoscale, the centimeter scale. One other thing that I wanted to mention is that if you look at these fruit bodies from above, one could ask how, how can you coordinate all of these spores to be shot at the same time? And the answer is we don't know, but this is something um, that would be uh, really cool to do. If you look at this um, apothecia from above, sometimes you'll see a wave of ejections that expands and its speed suggests that there is some mechanical interaction between them. Uh, sometimes you don't see it. So in the cases where you don't see it, what is it that triggers collective ejection is unclear. It would be lovely to have more data on this. And yes, can okay. you take a question from the floor? I'm sorry, yes. from the in-person room? Yes. Okay, go ahead, Pedro. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering about your, your formula, and um, you're now very into Sleratinia with apothecia, and they, uh, these apothecial ascomycetes tend to shoot all the assay at the same time, but you started off with uh, sodaria and um, uh, ascomycetes with the uh, Baratecia with a, a, a narrow osteo, which influences the whole process because Mm -hmm. They release one ascus at a time, and so you don't have this cycling effect as, as you showed. So shouldn't you consider this in your formula as well? So um, absolutely. So all, all uh, sexual spores, I think, have the same problem to cross the boundary layer. Here I'm telling you about one adaptation, which is collective ejection, which only occurs, as you, as you said correctly before, only for apothecial fungi. But the fungus, the fungus I showed you before is not, an, is not apothecial. It, it doesn't have all of the spores living at the same time. So it cannot enjoy 
the benefits of cooperation. So how does that fungus cross the boundary layer? Great question. We have, uh, um, over the years, I think at some point, we stopped going over um, different adaptations that different fungi may enact. But at some point, we collected all of the ideas that we had uh, in one paper. Uh, we have ideas about, for example, if you have all of the spores bundled together, you'll increase their mass. So that's enough to cross the boundary layer. Then you fall because if you increase mass, you also fall. You cannot enjoy being dispersed by air much, but that's a possible uh, way to get around uh, the constraint for non-apothecial fungi. Another way is uh, some fungi evolve spores that span the boundary layer in the sense that they are they are shot from tips. So the boundary layer where they're shot is very, tends to be much smaller. And the size of the spore can actually span the entire length. So as soon as they are shot, the tip will be outside of uh, the boundary layer. So that's another, um, another idea. I'm only talking about this because it's the only one that we have explored enough to be able to tell you, I think this is what happens, but okay, you're I, right. I, one more comment. Um, I just uh, yeah. set you thinking now, your examples are all about SI with eight ascospores, but some, um, uh, let's say, paratheseal ascomycetes uh, have factors of, of eight, so 16 or, or 64 or 128. Why would they do that? You know, could it be that they're trying to, uh, because it's also one ascus at a time, could it be they're trying to create this cycling effect like we showed? Although they so have more a, than, a so I. Region? So I, I think that would be too little, like 13, um, 32 spores would be too little to actually create a macroscopic wind. But something else that can happen is there can be the, if you have a big ascus and many spores, but mostly a big ascus, you can have the jet itself propel the spores. So some species, if you look at them, they have such massive assay that, the jet of uh, epiplasma that gets out pushes the spore the spores forward. So you can increase it's basically goes into the the um, class of uh, adaptations that increase the mass of the projectile, the effective mass of the projectile. And thirty two, I mean that, again, many that many spores could be enough that you cross the boundary layer even just by inertia because a factor of 32 means uh, a lot in terms of um, in terms of range it's not a factor of 32 because it's not linear but it's basically it's to the power two thirds that's good enough maybe i'm gonna say i'm gonna i'm gonna say that that it's um, 4.53 and we wrap up at, at five. So maybe choose your last five minutes, whatever story you want to tell. I know you've got a million slides left. Okay. Okay. I will. Uh, and maybe. Okay. What happens once the spores are out? Out, out, meaning outside of the canopy. Well, turbulence happens at that point. Here is a representation of what happens to cloud particles in a cloud they all get scattered and there's uncertainty. So this is sort of like a, a few years ago, we started to think about why or how to piece together the information. There is a, a lot of adaptations to do things well at the small scale, uh, but then at large scale, there's uncertainty. How can we piece them together? And so basically uh, the first piece of information is the atmosphere is a dangerous place to be in. And some spores will only survive an hour. Some other spores can survive either in the, in, even in the stratosphere. So there is a lot of variation, but the atmosphere is a harsh environment in general. Okay, this is the first piece of information. The second piece of information is that if you want to know how long a spore remains in the atmosphere, then you have to turn to physics again. 
and you have to think about how particles, generic particles get transported. This is what Daniele did and is doing also right now. We have a stream of different results that tell us that basically, if you do simulations across a large uh, volume and you repeat the simulations, you can calculate how long spores remain in the atmosphere. And it turns out it can go from hours to weeks. This depends, of course, on the details of the spore. But even if you take all spores exactly identical, same density, same size, same shape, just because of turbulence and of the differences that you find across the environments, the duration of a flight time of a, of a spore journey in the atmosphere varies from hours to weeks. Okay. So this, the combination of these two information, viability is limited in the atmosphere and flight time in the atmosphere varies a lot, makes it that fitness can change. So this is one aspect of fitness. If you think about the duration of a spore's journey in the atmosphere, what are the chances that a spore survives? This is the result from numerical simulations that say that basically during the day, spore flights are longer. And so if you pick any, like uh, let, let's pick six hours, uh, uh, viability six hours. So let's pick identical spores with the same size and same viability. Then their survival at noon is very limited because most of them will remain in flight longer than six hours. Okay, this is a, the very a first result that tells us that there's something here to think about. Okay, the constraint on this part, part of the talk will be, I've done everything at the micro scale, I've done the best I could. How can I ensure or maximize the chances that my spores remain in flight for a time scale that they can bear, that they don't die in flight, okay? And, and so the, the question comes back to us as, is there a wise way to um, release your spores, to choose the timing for spore release that maximize their chances to survive travel? Okay. In this case, what matters is turbulence. And the basics of this is very simple. During the day, this is depicted here. This is the intensity of turbulence. You can see that during the day, there's a lot of turbulence. This is driven by sunlight. Sunlight warms up the soil, which warm up the first layer of the, of the atmosphere. And so this sets in motion the air, the atmosphere goes into convection. So large turbulence means that spores that get ejected in these conditions get high up in the atmosphere, and then it takes forever to come down, days weeks okay so this is a dangerous time to release spores if your spores are short-lived the opposite happens typically during the night the atmosphere is stable there's no sunlight so there's no convection and if you shoot spores then they'll just go up a little bit and then come down in a matter of one hour two hours few hours okay so this is, again, how physics connects to these guys. If I was a fungus, how could I time for release correctly? Well, what I just told you is something that just requires a clock. You see here the simulations from Mexico. This is the uh, star in here. It's yellow. It's very regular. That means that every day is basically the same. There are 14 peaks here, and this simulation occurs over 14 days. So days are always turbulent, turbulent, and nights are always stable, okay? So I can use my circadian clock to release pores in this situation. But is this true everywhere? Well, these Purple regions are intermittent regions, are regions where this diurnal cycle is disrupted because of how the atmosphere works. Typically, this is northern. So if you go in Alberta, Canada, this is where 
the star is located, then turbulence is intense or weak independently on time of the day. The one day is not similar to another. You cannot use a clock. Okay, so this suggests that in fact, fungi in some regions should be able to time their ejection to time of the day. And in some other part of the world, of the, their biogeography is such that they live mostly in purple regions, this is dangerous because they shoot spores and they might remain in flight too long. So the question is, are there these different patterns? So the, the idea, theoretical idea that comes from this work is that some regions should be uh, should lead to regular patterns and some other regions should lead to intermittent patterns. And is this observed in nature? Well, there are some data. We've gone through the literature to find information about this. Um, about this. And it turns out some species do shoot at the same time every day, like these two species from this reference. Some other species shoot entirely intermittently. And maybe even the same species in different regions of the world have different patterns of liberation. And it's unclear what drives them. So the conclusion from this part of the talk are that if there is a diurnal cycle, then fungi could shoot at the same time every day. So specifically, if you have short-lived spores, you should shoot them at night. If you have long-lived spores, of course, you can also not care. The second conclusion is that if there are no diurnal cycles, then you cannot use time of the day. You have to use something else to infer what's the state of the atmosphere and how long your spore will remain in the air. This is part of ongoing work that I have no time to tell you about, but at least I'll, I'll put a slide there to tell you the bottom line. The third conclusion is that we can flip all of the arguments that I just presented. Right? Let's say that the patterns of, uh, of um, liberation are, are given. Can I tune something else so that I ensure maximum survival? One obvious thing you can tune is the survival. You could change the pigmentation on, this, on the wall of the spores, and th this will provide more or less resistance to UVs. For example, there could be different ways to, to produce more sturdy spores. So the prediction from our theory is that if you have small spores, those spores will remain in air for a long time. So those spores need to evolve sturdity. I don't know how to call it. To evolve adaptations that allow them to remain alive for a long time because they will remain in flight for a long time. All else being equal, if you have a large spore, it will sediment faster. So it doesn't need to evolve any specific adaptation to um, survive atmospheric conditions all that much. So this is part of uh, a work that I have to finish the revision for, and it's in collaboration with Anne. The experiments are done by uh, Jacob Golan, who is in the picture. The theory is done by, the simulations are done by Daniele, who you'll see in the next slide. This data, the very time consuming experiments confirm that similar closely related spores that have very different size follow the pattern in the sense that small spores are much more sturdy than large spores. And this is somewhat counterintuitive because if you think about germination, if you test them for germination, not for survival to the atmosphere, Typically, in those conditions, large spores germinate faster than small spores. Okay, I'll conclude conclude with the following movie, which uh, Daniele just uh, uh, just made, which depicts the regions where you can rely on uh, the diurnal cycles. So the yellow regions that there are typically south. There's a lot of them. You could times for ejection to this to the diurnal cycle. Um, but a lot of other regions are dark, which means that the diurnal cycle is unreliable. And in those conditions, you shouldn't rely on time of the day, but you should sense the, the state of the atmosphere and release force when appropriate according to the state of the atmosphere. 
this is ongoing work and I have a lot of exciting results. I would like to tell you, but it's 4.03. And so I think I should conclude. Does that make sense? Thanks, Marie-Lise. Yeah, sorry, I'm gonna say it takes me forever to manipulate the mouse. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Should I'm I... gonna start my video. And I think at this point, if you're online and you have questions, please go ahead and put your questions in the chat. Um, and if there are people in the room with questions, we can ask them as well. I'm not, can you see me, Agnese? I can see you, yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'm okay. gonna do this maybe so that you can, we can all see better. Okay, all right, yeah. Are there, are there questions in the chat? I'm gonna open it up. There's maybe I'll drive on essay just so I can control the questions from the room and intersperse them with questions from the from the chat. So there's a question in the chat that says, um, do you also consider environmental variables such as temperature? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let me see. Can I share again? It yeah, be I, quick. So. I won't give you the full thing. So basically what we did is we are considering all of the variables that a fungus could ever measure. This is from basically the, um, the most up-to-date um, weather data set uh, that we have as, you know, that meteorologists use. There are uh, 24 variables that are measured at the ground. So we selected all of them and we picked uh, all of them measured right before Take off, and then we ask what is the best variable. So, including temperature, potential temperature, pressure, humidity, latent heat, all of these variables measured at the ground. What is the the most useful variable? And very long story, very very short. The we found three variables. Here you have the clock. The clock is very lousy in these uh, intermittent regions. You see it here, this is the, how well can you predict um, the flight time only starting with the clock in intermittent regions. Of course, if you are in Mexico, that's almost perfect. But if you're not in Mexico, you cannot do that because the clock is very lousy. These are the, all of the variables that I told you about, all of the variables from the data set. This is just one family that we found out is particularly useful. And among that family, only three variables are actually enough to provide very good predictions, which means that if the fungus was able to measure these three things, then it, will, it would have a good sense of how long the spores remain in flight. These three variables are the temperature, the time derivative of the potential temperature and the latent heat flux. We can talk about this, but they are all involved in basically in the stability of the atmosphere. So it's somewhat related to the fact that when the atmosphere is unstable, the spores get up a lot. And so it takes a long time to come down. So the question is, can you predict when the atmosphere will be in those conditions? And it looks like these three variables are a good proxy for the state of the atmosphere. They give you a good sense of whether that's the case, the spore get up and then, uh, you know, it, they will remain in flight for a long time. Would be nice to know if fungi can measure these quantities and what measure, you know, can they do and how do they use them to release spores or not? But this is a different story. Are there questions in the, yeah, Miriam, there's a question in the room. Yes, I want to ask because not for many fungi, well, we work in laboratory, but it's not a lot of studies like that show uh, because for this population, we know that relative humidity is also really important. Um, so I don't know if when you test the dispersal or the spore dispersal, you have you also test in vitro first, or it's like you take all of the data from one location and then you follow the presence of the spores in those locations to make a model. 
So um, I think there are two parts to the question. One part is uh, humidity is important. Here, this is an entirely computational study where I just took everything I could from the environmental data set and asked in a completely blind way what works best. So it, there is no biological uh, plausibility or anything that's related to the fungi. It's just among all that's available to me as a meteorolog meteorologist, as a physicist, what can I use to predict spore flight? The three variables that seem most important, but you should bear in mind that there is no, it's not a theorem, it's just a statistics, basically. It's, it's uh, done with machine learning. So it says what is most likely to provide good answers, right? Are these three. And latent heat flux in a way co contains humidity. Uh, so a possibility is that humidity computationally is very important because it's within this variable. And for fungi, it is important for various reasons, right? Not only for this, I'm not, I, I can't assume that this is uh, everything that, the only thing that matters for sporulations. Maybe there are a lot of constraints that fungi need to fulfill in order to grow the spores, uh, you know, detach them correctly, form the fruit body. I don't know what else they would have to do, but you do all of that correctly and then you pick the liberation time. So if, I'm not hypothesizing that these are the only variables that matter. The other part of the question, I think, so uh, to what part of the talk are you referring to? Because uh, the experiments, uh, maybe to these experiments that ended in uh, her lab. Uh, when you show the map, uh, I think the it's map. The I think okay. it's the map. So this map. Yeah. So that is this map. Yeah. So this is a this is computational. Sorry, I went super quickly on this one. Um, this is a computational map that tells me, based on my numerical simulations. So there are no data. There are no fungi here. There's not even biology. It's only physics. It tells me what parts of the globe are reliable in terms of uh, uh, diurnal cycle. So it means, of, I told you, over the day, typically there's convection, so spores go up in the atmosphere and it takes a long time to come down. Typically at night, there's stratification. This typically is only where the diurnal cycle is reliable, meaning that days and nights alternate regularly and days are always convective and nights are always stable, right? And so you see these nice peaks periodic. That's the yellow curve here, this one right down here. But not all regions of the world are always this reliable. There are some regions of the world where convection happens randomly. And this is because not, there's not only convection, there are other reasons why turbulence might increase. There are, there, there's wind. Wind is not driven necessarily by, by how warm is the atmosphere or by sunlight, right? So there are regions where this uh, diurnal cycle is disrupted. And those are the purple regions. So here, this was a static map. And the movie that you've seen, this movie, is basically a map that gets updated month by month from 2004 and keeps cycling. And you see that over the winter, um, there is less, uh, the, the cycle is disrupted in a lot of parts of, uh, of the North American continent. Over the summer, you tend to have much more reliable uh, diurnal cycle. That's the yellow part. So this is more, it, it's easier to predict. You don't need to sense temperature to know if uh, the atmosphere will be convective. You can just time spore ejection to your circadian clock. The clock is enough. All right, Agnes, I think we're yeah, going to leave it at that. Thank you so much again um, for sharing thank this you. very different world with us. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you a lot, I hope. <laughs>
that something yes, came across. A big thank you from uh, Fabi side as well. Sorry that Bernard Silver is on sabbatical in Germany, so he couldn't do it in person himself. So uh, instead of him, I will do the closing, but thank you so much. I think you definitely let me look at my fungus even more detailed now, you know, like I, wanna, I was always thinking my fungus is a nice uh, releasing one rather than the morning one. I, will, I, will, I think I need to take it more <laughs> than that. But thank you so much. I think all of us get very excited for that. And I know that you are very easily accessible so that uh, I will, if someone, Needs to ask any other question, I'm sure you will answer them on the email as well. And um, absolutely. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, also joining and making this heavy seminars running as well. Thank yeah. you. And and for hosting. Ah, uh, yeah, pleasure. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure. All right, thanks, Anya. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much thank for you. hosting me. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.